Greetings Zimbabwe, Africa and the world. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, brought to you by Titan Law. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today I'm in conversation with Dr. Divine Simbi Ndlugula, the Managing Director of Securicom and Zukomborore Farms. Enjoy this inspirational conversation. Dr. Divine Lugula, welcome to In Conversation with Trevor and thank you so much for allowing us to come to, uh, to visit uh, the Comborere Farm where we are recording right now with uh, the, the sounds of the kettle in the background and uh, birds and the generator humming uh, in the background is happening in Zimbabwe. So thank you so much for this opportunity to, to, to be able to visit you. Thank you Trevor and uh, we are indeed honored for you guys to come out here. We, we, you, you were so generous to take us around the farm uh, to see the very impressive projects that you have around here. We'll mm -hmm. get into all that and also to uh, talk about Securico, uh, which is uh, the security company that you started, which is now one of uh, the biggest security companies in Zimbabwe. So there's lots, of, lots to talk about. Uh, thank you for that uh, opportunity. Let's start by taking you to uh, Gutu, where you were born and raised and looking at what's around us here this seems to be so far away from good just take us briefly into what it was like being uh, born and being raised in Gutu. Uh, Trevor growing up in Gutu obviously made me who I am today I grew up in a family that believed in uh, the culture of working and uh, working hard to be where you want to be I went to school in the raw area out there but certainly uh, I was in a better position because my father my parents were business people but uh, we had friends uh, that uh, we obviously went to school with and for me I grew up in an environment that I saw deprivation I saw obviously in, in a bit of privilege in, in, in my family but uh, what I know for sure is that my parents taught me that uh, whoever you see in life, at whatever level, uh, the relationships are very important. So my father, having been a business, prominent business person in his community, he was just one of the people. And uh, this is what I've grown up to be. And for me, that is the foundation that I also try, I always want to try to inculcate in my kids. I enjoyed my growing up because uh, my father certainly believed in me. He was one of those uh, people who was well ahead of his time. In the 70s, he wanted all of us to be whoever we wanted to be, whether you're a girl or a boy. At the time, girls, obviously, the ambitions, particularly from the parents, was different. Mm. Uh, they looked up to a girl to find a decent man to get married to, set up a home and so on. But my father used to encourage me to, to, to be ambitious mm. uh, because I was a straight A student. And each time I came home after the term, we were given numbers and I used to bring the number one. And he kept saying to me, never ever lose that position in your life. Wherever you're going to be, at whatever age as you grow, never ever lose that position that you are, you are a winner. So he inculcated in me this, this divine you see. Mm. So... Uh, th th that's that's very interesting. Mm. He, he, he was also in business, wasn't he? What kind of business was he into? The usual business that uh, the black people were in mm. rural shops. Yeah. He had the trucks, and uh, obviously he had this farm. Mm. Uh, yeah. That's, and and yeah. you you say yeah, uh, divine that when you as you are growing up, you had big dreams, and you were very clear about what it is that you wanted to become. Uh, are, are you living your dream right now? Yes, I'm certainly living my dream. My father uh, then said you'll be whatever you wanted to mm. be and I then in my mind I knew what I wanted to be and one thing I knew that I wanted to be is I wanted to be owning my own means of production. I knew I wanted to be in business. I often told my uh, peers in school that I was not going to work for so long uh, for other people. I'm going to start my own business 
and it's not going to be a small business. I was very clear about that position, and uh, I I simply knew exactly where. So for me, it's about uh, having known what I wanted to be, and mm -hmm. I set out to be that. And and she also, so, your your dad also gave you opportunities for for a good education. Do you want to take us through that education? Yes, absolutely. You know, we went to the schools in the rural areas, but however, we then went to boarding schools. Uh, around uh, grade six, uh, me and my siblings were sent out, sent, sent off to schools like Bondolf, Shishawasha, and so on and so forth. I went to St. Dominic's for my high school. Then I also finished at Makumbe Mission. I then uh, wanted to go to Roma University to do a program, and he paid for, for my fees at Roma. But uh, I don't know how he paid the fees. The fees never got to Roma. So I eventually uh, went to college in Arare, uh, and I did uh, accounting. And when I finished accounting I, I, accounting, I started working for Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation, ZBC, is an accounting officer. But uh, he, he, he always said to me, in fact, when I was growing up, my father thought I was going to be a lawyer because uh, I, was, I could argue my, my situations out of anything. Uh, I was a good uh, speaker. <laughs> so it, he always used to tell his friends, my daughter is going to be a lawyer, or maybe I want you to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. I don't know why he also wanted me to be a doctor, because uh, I thought, you know, he, I, I think he thought that uh, he possibly wanted a doctor in the family. So those are the things that he always said, you, she's going to be a lawyer or a doctor, but obviously I wanted to be a business person. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, he didn't live to see me, to see this, this, uh, this position I am today. So it, mm. it sounds like your dad did quite a lot to make you confident to stand up for the things that you, that you believe in. He inculcated this very confident woman that you have become, confident person that you have become. Absolutely. Uh, and see, I think they say behind every successful daughter, there's a father, a doting father, an encouraging father. And I always encourage fathers. Uh, give your daughter, inculcate the self-confidence that she requires for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Encourage her to be worship. And uh, you know, we never used to be allowed to climb trees as girls. For many reasons, I'm sure you know yeah. some why we could not climb trees as girls. And I would climb trees, my father would say, you know, she can climb a tree. My mother would say, she cannot climb a tree. So those are the things that, uh, you know, I, I always look back and say that that upbringing is so key and it's so so it, it, it those were the defining years mm -hmm. for me to be where i am today mm -hmm. w were you the only child or no no, no there oh. was there were eight of us eight of you and i was a kind of a middle person mm -hmm. and and you've already spoke uh, shared with us that you worked mm -hmm. at zbc from zbc you also spent quite some time at old mutual yes and then from Old Mutual, you went and worked for Intermarket Life Assurance. Correct. You have very interesting stories about your time at uh, Intermarket Assurance. It appears like at Intermarket uh, uh, um, Life Assurance, that's when you started thinking about going out in business and doing your own things. Talk to me about that. In fact, Trevor, I didn't start wanting to be in business at Intermarket. I started wanting to be in business well before that. As I worked at ZBC, I would drive from ZBC Pockets Hill yeah. to factories in the industrial areas uh, to order clothes, buy clothes, and sell to colleagues at work. And I eventually even uh, got other friends who were working in other government institutions or other companies to sell clothes for me. And I think uh, I, I did uh, discuss with you earlier when, when I said I was having a track. The track, I, I bought it from profits I made out of selling clothes at work. So I started selling clothes at ZPC, and when I was at Old Mutual as, as well, I was selling clothes. And I would uh, give out to three, four, six friends so that they could sell, and they were selling them on commission for me. And I actually made quite a bit of money just selling clothes, dresses, beautiful dresses that I ordered from factories in Harare. What, what, what mm. was the driving force divine, if, mm. if you could help me understand this? Was it because you wanted money or you were looking for, for something else uh, in, in, in venturing out and being a, a busy bee as it were? No, I don't think uh, if you are in a true entrepreneur, you go into business to make money. Right. Because that's the wrong reason. You go into, into business because there are certain goals you want to achieve. There are certain things that you want, there are certain impacts that you want to see. For a start, obviously, I wanted uh, 
decent livelihood for my kids, for my family. Yeah. I ended up having to look after my father, my mother, my father died. And uh, obviously I ended up having quite a, a number of dependents who were depending on me. Uh, my siblings that were still going to school, I actually had to take it upon myself to look after them and my mother as well. So I also had my own son at the time. Soon after I started working, I had my son. So you realize that I had a family that for me required me to. So it was not about looking for money. It was obviously a situation. And most women go into business because they have to, because they've got to put uh, uh, food, food on the on table. The table. Mm. So for me, that was one of the biggest uh, motivators for me to be doing that. But because I was also looking for scalable businesses, because I was saying, I want to do, I want to be in business. I also want to employ other people. What is so special about uh, the Deltas or the old Michels or whatever? They were started by people under a tree like this. So we can, you know, we, why can we also not do it? I'm, I'm, I'm mm. imagining young men and young women mm. watching you right now and listening mm. to you and saying, wow, that's fantastic. Mm. But where does that come from? It's not everybody wants to start a business to put uh, food on the table. When you look deep down, what was inspiring that, uh, that drive to be an entrepreneur, to be your own, to be your own employer, as it were? The, the, the need to support other people, to help other people, mm. to make a difference in society, society mm. and say, okay, I think I have what it takes mm. to do this. And what it takes is for me to put, to put my best foot forward and start doing this. In so doing, I'm providing a decent livelihood for my family. I'm also employing other people that need that, those jobs. I'm also impacting a society. I'm also impacting economy. I'm also impacting a number of other issues that are key for, because we all look up to be employed by Barclays Bank, by Standard Chartered Bank, but that bank was started by somebody. Somebody has got to go out and start creating those jobs. We can all, we can not all live off jobs that have been created. They need, there's need for more jobs to be created. So it is about that impact. It's about that uh, social aspect to, 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 to ensure that you play your part. At the end of the day, when you leave this, this world, what have you done? Uh, you know, we, we have been given uh, different uh, opportunities. And I say, if I've got an opportunity to create things that will change things in this world for the better, why mm. shouldn't I not do it? Mm. So I'm, I'm, I'm torn between where do I start, security mm. code, or do I start with the Zucomborero? What came first for you? Was it security code uh, or Zucomborero? Because both of these are amazing businesses and I'm itching to get into each one of the, them and dissect them in terms terms of uh, why you started them and so forth. Where shall we start? I started with Shukumbarero. Interesting. Yes, I started with Shukumbarero. Securico is a business that came after I'd already started farming here. Yeah. I've been farming here yeah, for the past 28 years. And and <laughs> what, what drew you into farming? Is it because your dad was into farming or is there something again inside Divine that was itching to get into farming? Well, farming is something that uh, was really in, in my guts. I had a deep passion for farming, even as I was growing up, I, I liked planting trees. Up to today, one of my major interests and one of my major passions is plant trees. I plant trees. If I can plant a tree every week, that's me. Mm. I enjoy doing that. So for me, farming is something that was there, deep down in me as a person, but certainly it was uh, for me to end up farming at Shukomborero here was more of a by default because uh, this farm was bought my, by my father but when he died my brother inherited and eventually you know uh, I had to rescue a situation uh, where the farm was being foreclosed because my brother had gotten into some some days using the title deeds of the farm so I had to rescue that position to, to reinstate it so that it could not uh, be sold. Mm. So that's how I ended up uh, farming here mm. at Shukumbariro. But however, I would have been farming anyway for mm. that matter if mm. I had not been here. Mm. I had actually been, when I was working uh, at Indermarket, I was not wanting to buy a house. We were getting loans to buy houses. But I was looking for a loan to buy a plot. I had identified a plot in Arare to buy, but my employer said we are not buying plots for employees here because we are not buying clothes for people to go into business, but houses for people to live in, homes mm. for people to live in. 
So for me, farming is something that I would have done even without having a, a by default a farming farming here at Shkombarero. Mm. And, and your, the passion for farming with you is so infectious. I mean, you, it's so obvious as we walked around the farm today that you, you are so into this. Uh, and and, and the, the, the varied activities that, are take, that do take place here. Talk to me about that passion. You say it's, it's in your gut. Uh, just explain that. What, what does that mean? Well, I think, you know, if you see a seed, eventually you see a, fruit, a tree like this producing a fruit. It's something that uh, gives you so much satisfaction. That is what gives me satisfaction. Mm. I, we made goats here, we made cattle here, and uh, you see them uh, getting pregnant, you see them dropping the kids, you dropping the calves, you start seeing the calves growing. You know, it is amazing. And you are saying, you know, oh, ah, this, this, this is amazing. Mm. You are putting life uh, by just planting these trees, mm. by just uh, seeing these uh, cattle drop uh, their, their, their calves. Mm. You're seeing life transform right in your eyes. Mm. And that is And very you hear that noise in the it, background. <laughs> you see, yeah, that noise in the background. Yeah. It was just a seed mm. one day. So we, we, we took a, a tour uh, early on uh, uh, in the day. Uh, divine and you showed us quite a lot of things that you're doing on the farm. Uh, I'm asking you now for the benefit of the viewers for us to take us for you to take us through what we what we we, we, we observed during our tour uh, the goats and if you could outline to us uh, the breeds that you have uh, and then the the cattle uh, we we looked at uh, the cattle taking uh, uh, your weekly the, their weekly dip. So let's start with the goats, which is a very impressive uh, project. Getting into uh, the the, the var various breeds that you have on, on the farm. Trevor, we have uh, we do start breeding of a uh, war goats, start breeding of a uh, Kalari red goats. We have, we have also just started the milk goats, the sunning and we are bringing in another one called the Togenbeck. We also do um, crossbreeding with indigenous goats so that we produce, you know, a more hybrid vigor uh, kids that we have, we're we showing you here. So um, the start breeding of goats, it's, it's a new thing in Zimbabwe, and, but it is certainly taking off. And uh, we are happy that we are part of the, uh, the people that have mm -hmm. championed that because uh, it's an area that I want to believe as farmers in Zimbabwe, there's a lot of scope. There's a lot of scope because uh, uh, there's a demand for, for goats in the, in the, in the Arab world, uh, even here in Africa. So yes, there is a serious scope. Again, we are working with many smallholder farmers in mm -hmm. goat production because a lot of uh, people cannot afford to have cattle because they are a lot more expensive and even to, to, to look after, not just uh, to buy, but certainly to look after. You find that a lot of farmers in the rural areas lost their cattle through the, the disease called teleriosis mm. because of non-dipping. Mm. Whereas with goats, any farmer in the rural community can, can look and can, can keep goats and make a livelihood, a decent livelihood for that matter. We have worked models for some NGOs that we are working with currently, and it's working. We have worked with almost like uh, 14 NGOs in the last two years, and that has transformed a number of those uh, small smallholder farmers in places like Gokwe, Shuru, Mutoko, Boera, and so on. So you find that uh, goat production in Zimbabwe, for me, it is a game changer for smallholder farmers mm -hmm. or even big commercial farmers as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you are essentially helping them to improve mm -hmm. the quality of their goats and the quality of the meat, the, the weight of uh, the goats and, and that kind of stuff. Could you talk to us through that and the NGOs that you're working with, Divine? Yeah. Okay, it's just not improving the quality. Yes, mm. we are improving the quality. There's nothing wrong with our indigenous goats, but uh, it is the inbreeding that has been happening, and it's also the fact that uh, the growth of a uh, indigenous goat and in an exotic or improved goat like a boa or color red is different. So by crossbreeding, you are ensuring that you are getting the best of the two. Mm. Uh, 
So you find that the, the yes, it's improving the quality of the meat, mm -hmm. it's improving the growth, it's also shortening the growth uh, a period for you to quickly yield something and sell. Mm -hmm. And uh, besides that, we are also helping them with the uh, capacity building. They need skills because the knowledge is power. If you want to go into a business and if you know, if you don't know how we are going to run that business, it's very dangerous. So we are helping with uh, capacitating the smallholder farmers, obviously giving them the necessary uh, trainings that they require to ensure that they run sustainable good production uh, operations. Uh, we, we help them with off-taking. We, we, we are working on a project currently that is going to look at the whole value chain. We are then going to be selling the goods and at what price is it fair price and and so on and so forth. So that whole value chain, we are supporting that uh, particular uh, project, uh, which is under the Zimbabwe Agricultural Growth Program. And uh, we are one of the few private sector players that have been robbed in in this EU project that we are working in. And we are hoping that in all the districts that we are going to work, it's, it's already started showing uh, quite a, a lot of progress. Uh, people out there are getting a better quality goods. They can now go and sell and sell periodically to derive a better livelihood. And you're going into mm. goat cheese. Mm. Uh, talk to me about that project. We, there's a niche for, for goat cheese not just in Zimbabwe, also out there in the 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 Western world. So I'm I'm talking to some people that we are working on. We are working uh, on together to start producing a, a goat cheese. But obviously, you need to start producing the milk. So here we have started working with the sun and goat, mm -hmm. and we are bringing the token big. These are milk goats, and in future we hope that we can roll it out to other farmers. Because uh, just one farm cannot produce enough milk to produce goats, goat cheese to export. You need quite a bit of uh, milk production to do that. So it is uh, an area that we hope that we can also bring in other farmers, either small older farmers or medium or large scale farmers. Mm. And the, um, we s I saw uh, uh, cows or cattle that I've mm. never seen on your farm the sizes. Take us through the breeds that you have here and why you're doing what you're doing. Right, we chose, because of climate change, Trevor, we chose to work with the local breeds or what we call African breeds. So we do start breeding of the Boran. It's a Kenyan breed. We do start breeding with the Thule. It's a Zimbabwean breed, but it is it has gone worldwide. South Africa, Australia, they're now using the Thule as well. We use. We are also working with the Mashona. We also do start breeding of Mashona. I'm sure you've heard this Texas Mashona. It mm. came from Zimbabwe. Mm. So we are working with those three breeds. But however, we also do. A com we run a commercial head, which is a mix of all sorts. We are happy with those breeds, and we are doing well with those breeds. Yes, we need to supplement them, but certainly because they are breeds that are not too huge we we can manage to to, to 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 supplement them without having to spend a lot more money uh, we, we we have done well at the even at the zimbabwe national um mm. uh, breed sale we've been uh, selling uh, a few of our bulls there and uh, we have a number of people coming to to look at uh, what they can get from us mm. uh, in terms of breeding stock uh, beyond that we have uh, animals that are not suitable for breeding that you cannot say then say you sell them as bulls so we we call them steers and those are the steers that you saw in the feedlots here mm. we put them in the feedlots when they are only about 18 18 months they're about mm -hmm. we feed we feed lot them we fatten them for 90 days and we take them to to slaughter to the abattoirs for meat and we attain the super grid because it is a, it is a young animal that can give you tender meat. So we're selling through our retail outlets, but however, we're moving away from that model. We're going into, into we have already started selling uh, through, through, through online, mm. and we'll, lo we'll be launching an online store. Currently, we even have a few customers buying from us from all over the world in diaspora who are buying for their families out here. Mm. And that is a model that uh, we, we think is, is going to be the future. 
and we, we, we tested the beef over, over lunch um, and uh, it, it's sweet beef. And uh, my favorite is, uh, you know, the beautifully, beautifully matured uh, beef. Talk to me about that because that's my favorite. You, you do have cl uh, clients who, who, who want the uh, matured beef? Yeah, we, we, we do matured beef. There is a small, small clientele that want matured beef, interestingly. In our community, I guess that is something that is still to, to, to be accepted. For me, I, I like you, I want the matured beef, 21 days and above in the cold room. That's what I, I yes, we do supply as well matured beef, mm. uh, but it is for people that have really asked us to, to do that for them. Generally speaking, you know, people would rather have uh, fresh, fresh meat, beef. Mm. beef that has just been slaughtered. Whereas, uh, obviously, matured beef uh, is, 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 is something else it's for other people, beautiful. but uh, it's beautiful beef, as you, as you know. Beautiful. Oh. Let me take you back to uh, the Boer Gods, oh. because there's been an interest from the Zimbabwean community uh, for people to, to, to invest in Boer Gods. What are the advantages of the Boer Gods, and how do I know that uh, uh, this is the pure breed uh, there's an F1, there's an F2. Just talk to us through that because I know there's a lot of Zimbabweans who are interested in investing in Boer Gods. Yeah, certainly people have got to know what is a Boer God, what is not a Boer God. Yeah. I've often seen people who have got F1 or F2 or F3 Gods saying this is a, I, I bought a Boer God when it's not a Boer God. So a Boer God has got characteristics that are quite distinct. Mm -hmm. It's got a, a, a head which is a Roman, you know, like a, a, a a, a, a basketball. It's, it's got a, a head which is brown. Mm. I mean, well, most of these, the ones that are not even a pure ghost, are, I've got a brown head. But certainly, it's got to have a strong head. If mm. it's a male, it's got to have a, a strong neck. It's got to have the length of a male. It's got to have the correct rump. It's got to have strong legs. Mm. Uh, 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 the horns have got to go in a certain pattern. They cannot go in a certain pattern if it's a pure goat. Then, of course, the F1 is the mixture between the pure and our indigenous. But however, there's nothing wrong with an F1 goat. It's still a very good goat. It's, it's half of the other and it's, it's going to grow, not as slow, but as fast, mm. uh, but in between the two. And in terms of uh, winning weights, you find that a pure, pure, pure goat can win at uh, 28, 30 kgs. Mm. It's 100 days, 800 days. An indigenous perhaps you can get 10, 11 kgs, but uh, with an F1, 15, 17 kgs. So those are the differences. Mm. And, and you are also into fish. <laughs> uh, and we had fish, uh, your beautiful fish over, over lunch. Take, take us through again that project and uh, where it started and where, you, where, you, 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 where you're headed with uh, the fish project. Right, yeah, we have got two ponds here that we have just, one of them we just harvested. We just finished in, finished harvesting it, I think, about two days ago. We put in a unsexed, they are called unsexed, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, fingerlings, mm -hmm. 15,000. Mm -hmm. And you feed them for six months, but I think we eventually fed ours for almost nine months because we couldn't harvest them in the winter. We had to wait for, 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 for this time around to harvest them. So at that point, they should be about uh, 300, 400 grams each. So we, we, we are bringing in another lot on the 5th of, of next month, another 15,000 into that particular fish pond. So we harvest again after about six, seven, eight months. Uh, we are planning, uh, if all goes well, we are planning to put a bit more of those ponds. Perhaps we'll be running five ponds of uh, 15,000 of of those uh, growing fish all the time so that the harvesting is happening mm. year round. Mm. And you have chickens too? We have uh, layers. layers. We, we have uh, egg laying uh, uh, layers. So watching you as we walked around, yeah. you have more than 34 people working with you on this farm. You are very hands on. You know basically everything that happens here. You, you made me realize that uh, farming is a back-breaking job. 
talk to me about how much time you put into this. Uh, and clearly, you're not a cell phone farmer. Well, I think one of the things that uh, we should know is that uh, if you're not hands-on in business, and I won't believe any business for that matter, you lose money easily. You lose money. In fact, you'll be wasting your money or you're wasting your time. So for any business, one has got to be hands-on because uh, you cannot lead something that you don't know. You cannot lead something, you cannot be exemplary in terms of understanding what is going on. Your team members, your team uh, will not be able to, they, they, will, they, will, they will not take your leadership seriously because uh, they look at you and they think, oh, she's so ignorant. I mean, already uh, the confidence, you lose the confidence mm -hmm. as, the, as, as the entrepreneur. The people that you are leading, you, you are leading, are saying we are being led by a blind person. Mm. What happens if people think they are being led by a blind person? So you need to know. You need to be in the trenches, it, as it were, with them. A good uh, of the times, a good uh, number of the times. So for me, I enjoy working with the cattle here. Is uh, just not that uh, I'm, I, I enjoy it, because if we do, if you don't love what you do you will not uh, succeed at it. So I, I enjoy going out there, you know, dipping the cattle. If it is, it is vaccination day, I am part of that whole process. If we are winning, if we are selecting, I've got to know this is not a good uh, heifer for that particular bull and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. You've got to know that. And then, of course, your team can have confidence in your leadership. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I could see the passion as we were walking mm -hmm. around. I could see, we saw the goat that had just died, mm. and I could see the pain yes. uh, on your face. We mm. saw the, uh, uh, the cow that is battling with a, with a, a leg. cancerous leg, mm. and I could see the pain there. Mm. So talk to me about that passion, Divine. Well, uh, they say anything in life uh, is a characteristic attitude, one of the major characteristics of attitude is that passion. And if that passion is not there, it, it doesn't make sense. The knowledge, the money, the skill, maybe even the background might not work as long as you don't have the passion. You need that passion and you need to consistently work at what you're doing. That passion is going to be ignited all the time because if you're, if, if you're not passionate, you can easily give up. Mm -hmm. You lose momentum easily in uh, giving up when you've started something usually. In any case, there's nothing that you do on this earth that you will not uh, meet some insurmountable problems. And if you have the passion, the passion is that helps you uh, continue. And is, the, is that what gives you the momentum to continue? Uh, you can wake up one day and say, no, I'm tired because things go wrong everywhere. And if things go wrong, you can, uh, you, can, uh, you can easily say, I think I'm done. Mm. I think you've seen, we have seen a number of people that have given up. Without the passion. The, because the passion was simply not there. And you can't copy passion. And you can't copy passion. Mm. You can't. Uh, let's go now to your mm. other business, which you're mm. passionate about, uh, Securico. Uh, how did you start this business? And why did you start this business? Well, Securico is a business that I started after I'd also tried other things. Eh? I'd already started farming, you remember? So I was working and uh, I would go into buildings. The first pe persons that we met, or we meet, are guys. And I could see these people did not have the necessary confidence that you need when you're talking to somebody who is at his work. They didn't. Uh, they had very low self-esteem. And I realized that obviously, they, I'd traveled. I traveled in places like Europe where guys were confident, where they were just as professional as any other uh, uh, job. So I said, because as an entrepreneur, I would, I would be looking at opportunities. And I could see there's an opportunity in this sector. Because uh, if one goes in, and goes in with the right mind, mindset of in calculating the right thinking into 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 the people that work in the, the sector, certainly is going to be there's going to be a difference. 
I, I yearned to be seeing girls that I would see in places like uh, Holland, where I'd been in England. And I said, but what is the difference? It's the same job. So there's an opportunity. And I, I just saw that gap. That mm. gap is the gap of the quality orientation of a professional security person who is wanting to save you because it's the front line of any business that you walk into. And I said, if somebody were to inculcate the right thinking and uh, get them to really see that the job that they're doing, because it comes from lack of self-esteem in what you're doing. Mm. So I said, I think this is a sector that I, I, I want, because I was looking for a scalable kind of business. You remember I'd already started yeah. farming and I had had my fingers bent at some stage in my earlier years as a, as a farmer. So I then I was working again and then I said, perhaps let me go into, into security. But I was very convinced that the security business was a game changer mm. because I could see I had learned I had learned my lessons, a lot of my lessons before, in a few things that I had tried. So, no, go go ahead, go ahead. Let me not stop you there. Yeah. So then I I I, I started uh, on the drawing board, doing a feasibility study in terms of what does it take, mm. what is the problems, what what can I do to make a difference, what is it that I'm going to do to ensure that that market that so requires that quality oriented uh, security personnel I'm going to deliver. How am I going to deliver it? Mm -hmm. So that's, that was the beginning of it. So I, I, the, my study told me that there is great scope in you going in there with a product that is going to change the mm -hmm. thinking. Mm -hmm. that, that takes a lot of confidence, uh, mm -hmm. Divine, because you are getting into a sector where there's big firms operating there who've been there for uh, 50 years, years 60, mm. 70 years, and you sit there and say, I have spotted a gap. Mm. Uh, that takes a lot of confidence in yourself. Yeah, uh, it, it does take confidence, which confidence I believe I had already been drilled into by my own father as I was growing up. But certainly for me, it is, it's, Attitude is that little thing that makes the whole lot of difference. And uh, my attitude always is that uh, I've got to be positive. I've got to, 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 to say whatever I'm going to do is going to succeed. Because I believe in my own capability. That self-belief is so important. And uh, I knew that uh, the security business was going to be a game changer. It's, I, 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 as you are saying, there were companies that had been in business for 30 years, if I'm not mistaken, or more than 30 years. And uh, there, were, there were big corporates that uh, you, even some of my friends said, huh, you must be joking. <laughs> you want to go up and again, it's the story, and so you think you are up to it. You and, don't. and you are yeah. a woman. And you are a woman. You are going against an industry that's got, uh, that is dominated by a man. And that didn't put you down. No, that didn't put me down. Certainly didn't put me down. If anything, I said, uh, that business, because I remember I went to this young guy uh, and I wanted him to do something about our logo. And uh, I wanted us to talk about a strategy that I, I was saying. I, we, I, we, had, we had already started Securico, very small at the time, perhaps we had only about uh, 70 cars or thereabouts. So I said, I want to come up with, I've got this logo, I want you to refresh it, but at the same time, I want you to look at uh, what is the strategy that we can use Yes, I've got my own strategy, and that strategy is working. But I want us to work around it to see how. And he asked me, "Who is your competition?" Because those are the sort of because he's taking a brief. Mm. Who is your competition? And I said, "Sorry, and so I won't mention names here." Mm. And he said, "Oh, oh, oh, hold on, uh, hold on, there, Mrs. Nchukula. It's not a uh, sorry and so the competition. You have got seventy cars. These guys have got fourteen thousand cars. How can you say it's your competition?" Your competition is so and so. Don't you know the small companies that are around? I said, no, those are not my competition. My competition is that company because the work that they have is the work that we want. Mm. And we are going to get that work. Mm. They were two of them. They looked at each other. They thought I was crazy. And uh, they just said, okay. Uh, they just took the brief, but uh, they were not convinced. But I knew that uh, certainly the work that those companies that I had mentioned is the work that I was going to get. And you started Securico 
with uh, one thousand two hundred dollars savings with four uh, colleagues uh, in your backyard. Talk to me about that start. Thank you.